Welcome to Smash the Class, a podcast that discusses topics in education from an anarchist perspective. This project is part of the Anarchist Pedagogies Collective, which seeks to create a space for anyone interested in anarchist education, regardless of expertise or background. For our eighth episode, we were joined once again by Carl Eugene Stroud. He previously joined us back in episode three to discuss Especifismo and digital learning, but this time the tables are turned because he comes in to interview us and to discuss language learning and its various impacts. Since he wonderfully introduces how this topic came to be in the opening to our discussion, I do not want to speak over him and will let that stand on its own. As a reminder, for those who haven't heard Carl speak before, he's a tutor who teaches French, Spanish, and English online to students of different ages who all live in different parts of the world. As for the three of us present, Sonia, Yotam, and myself, Nicole, we are people who all either live in non-English speaking environments or who do not speak English as our first language. So without further ado, here's Carl to start us off. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Carl and, uh, I was part of a writing workshop that was uh, hosted online and in person with a group that's in Chile that is called Solidaridad FCL. And it's, um, uh, the, the organ, the, the workshop was organized to teach us how to write opinion columns, uh, specifically a, a militant writing of opinion columns. And the uh, I, I learned a lot of things in that that workshop, but uh, we were all we were all sort of supposed to be working on something throughout it. So we we were kind of bouncing ideas off of each other, and people were reading each other's uh, writings up to different points and getting feedback. And so I I learned a lot about collective writing, and also about. Uh, how how that feedback is not really like when it when it comes to militant writing that feedback is not actually you know coming at your opinion it's coming at the task at hand right and how well the tool is able to accomplish its goals so one thing i i really learned that i've been able to convey to a lot of other people in different contexts already and that was part of my own writing in doing this, which which is uh, the writing I did that came out of that workshop, um, is is the idea that there's a, an intertextual uh, objective and an extra textual objective. So you have a kind of uh, thing you're trying to do with the arguments and the reasoning and and the rhetoric in your writing. And you know that relates to making it logical and progress and thinking uh, about um, what order to put it in. Uh, but then there's there's an actual external objective, which is like, why is this piece being written? What is it accomplishing? And actually needing to answer that before is is really different in an opinion column than in an essay or an informational article. And something I learned is that, you know, especially in the anarchist movement in the US, we tend to kind of produce writings and then not know what to do with them exactly. And so that that, you know, fits very much into zine culture and spreading ideas, but it makes it so that you end up being someone who has to go around convincing other people of some writing. And that can be very, not only very like hard, also just very awkward and kind of alienating to the person that did the writing and to the people listening to you, right? It's it's a strange thing that like seems like self-promotion, even if that's not really the point. And so actually having an external objective is sort of what lets you know, like what needs to be written. It's not a personal reflection. It's like this this thing is needing to be accomplished in an actual context and a writing to a specific publication or to a website, or in this case, us doing a podcast is, uh, there are ways of, of accomplishing that task through that writing and making sure that the, the text fits to do that. That's something that I learned. And, uh, 
that's that's yeah like really changed my perspective on what what the point of of engaging with the writing even is to begin with that that having a good idea on your own is fine but then it actually needs to be an idea about something already happening it's not it's not actually legitimate to just start from your idea and then go find a place to put it so um yeah like uh we did this this um kind of sharing stuff along the way and this article that i wrote which uh was originally written in spanish as the the workshop was in spanish and yeah i mean i i speak spanish i teach spanish uh i do uh private lessons of french and spanish and english uh but you know i am also interested in improving my spanish i've written a lot less in spanish and especially when it comes to militant writing so i was just interested in engaging with that as some good practice on my own and i ended up learning just a lot about writing in general and um but but when it comes to to the uh the spanish uh my my article was originally written in spanish and the result of it was kind of through this method that i was taught uh through the people in this group specifically uh marcela morales and pablo abufom they uh, were the two militants leading the workshop and i learned a whole whole lot from them and uh i've continued to be in in contact with them and uh, see them as really important uh, mentors in in this experience that I had. Um, so in Spanish, the the column is called Idiomas Secundarios, Frutos del Turismo, o Juegos del Cellular, which uh, we eventually translated into English as Tourism and Apps, All You Need to Learn a Language, right? Uh, and so the the process of writing it was already a kind of collective thing through this feedback I was getting. And originally I thought I was, you know, writing something about um, a situation that it more or less it affected people in my local context. And actually in that uh, writing workshop, the feedback I was getting from people in a whole different place in the world in a different language was actually the same thing. Like they, they related a lot to these points I was making. And it, it I realized that like, um that was that was part of the objective of this column is that like there are a lot of people who who are experiencing this exact problem and while the uh the solution proposed by my column of just you know corresponding more and talking more with people in other places and in other languages is not super um grandiose i think that it's it actually just isn't proposed kind of in that concrete and really just uh, clear uh, terms. And so even the translation that we have here is the result of uh, some of the students that I have uh, are, I, I work a lot with, uh, with comrades who are wanting to study other languages. And so uh, with some other anarchists in town, we've been meeting for uh, several months and we study uh, sometimes like short stories, sometimes news articles and different things like that together. And so we undertook like translating the Spanish into English as a group task. We'd never done anything like that before. And so we learned a lot through doing that as well. Um, those of us participating are at different levels and, and everything. And so it allowed us to have a kind of project that everyone sort of took charge of a part of it. And we trusted like, yeah, that paragraph is that person's, you know, and um, when it's your turn to go through and give an edit, what you do, we trust what you did, you know, and that uh, what what's going to come out isn't going to look like any one's thing. It's going to look like the thing that says what we think it needs to in that same idea of the original thing. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of... Uh, the background behind this. And so I wanted to speak to the, uh, to, to y'all in particular, to the Anarchist Pedagogist Collective, because I know that the, the premise behind this is already international and multilingual. And because of that, it seemed first like the ideal place to send my Spanish article. And that when we started discussing like how the conversation around that would work 
the need for the English translation also became apparent. And so, yeah, like the, the, the dialogue between like the destination for this and how it has shaped has already been kind of uh, coming from lots of places. And this seemed like the ideal platform for that kind of discussion. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm interested to talk to to y'all about this and hear your perspectives and maybe, yeah, we can come up with some new ideas and new uh, things to tackle in our local context as well. So I have some questions here and I'll just go ahead and pose the first one, which is uh, how are internationalism and multilingualism related in theory and in practice? So, uh, yeah, anyone have any ideas on that <laughs> right off the bat? I kind of tend to see more people using it as a basis of translation. Um, like, obviously, we get a lot of translation of movements, of events. Um, but kind of like, I also kind of see that there needs to be this expansion, of, uh, kind of like the expansion of knowledge, but including like our perceptions of people, concepts, places, um, both of these for better or worse, <laughs> because oftentimes like we might be using language that can be quite harmful and not knowing in what way it can be harmful, whether or not it's like a bigoted concept or if it is one in one place, um, but also not being able to actually get across like a, an idea <laughs> or even just a, a general concept. So I feel like there is a lot of room between both internationalism um, and multilingualism, or some people also call it plural, plurilingualism, because <laughs> there's just like a whole range of different ways of talking about it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where I would think a big chunk of it is, is not just in translation, because I think that's where people's brains automatically go to, but in just being able to um, understand people on their own terms rather than having our terms kind of thrust upon them in order for them to be understood. I think it's important also to, well, when it comes to multilingualism uh, in theory, in the last a couple of decades, everything that has been done when it comes to research has been very focused on the neurological aspect of it. While before that, in the 20th century, it was more you uh, focused in in what Nicole was mentioning, right? How do we learn? How do we code it? What kind of meanings we have behind it? How is it related to culture? Because some people think that, oh, it's just a language, like it's just words without no context, no meaning, no history, but actually it's quite the opposite. That's why actually translating uh, um, tasks are so difficult because actually there's a lot of words in one language that you don't have in another. Because perhaps there has been no necessity for it. Uh, and the thing is that this is something, I guess, um, multilingualism has been used now, again, as a, 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 I think in practice has been too attached to the, the capacity of workers to move around, but not, not necessarily into building up solidarity. Because, you know, it takes time. Uh, but I think that, yeah, it has been instrumentalized in practice in the last yeah, 40 years, perhaps. Uh, and one example is, well, we will talk more about that, but one example is this apps, right? That it seems that you're going actually to learn to communicate. I don't know. I've never learned anything through these apps. I mean, uh, you know, languages are tools and you have to be in a context and use them socially actually to learn. Uh, so so I guess that uh, as a, in, in the same way that we have more uh, boundaries now, national boundaries and you know, we have also this compartmentalized or fragmentized way of learning languages without a context, without the history. And this is something I think that actually damages the the international solidarity. Um, and well, I, I guess there's something we have also to work with in our anarchist movements and organizations and, and groups, right? Oh, to definitely. return to the more militant aspect of being multilingual and translating and trying to engage in creating 
uh, communities, not only think that you, we are just going to throw words around and, you know, be able to, you know, get some <laughs> food somewhere when we are traveling. I mean, it's much, much more than that. It's the, the activist uh, context or, or the background of it. I guess when I was thinking of that that question, and especially when I was listening to, to Sonia's response, which I think was was absolutely great, I'm constantly reminded of Esperanto and how that wasn't really that successful as a as kind of some some sort of a you know a, attempt to to create a language that is outside of context, outside of time, um, belonging to all for all that sort of thing. And of course, none of it is is. Is, is true to that experiment even if if it even if we can kind of salvage some 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 good intent um, but even then you know there's there's a bit of a problem there but I think one of the lessons from that and and some a key thing that I keep coming back to when I think about multilingualism and internationalism in the context of of of, of radical leftist politics I guess if I'm trying to be very general um, is is the, a sense of hum of humility, I guess, that we need to to kind of take on. I am not a native English speaker, and I've been living in an, in in a native English speaking place for quite a while now. And the more I'm here, the more I understand how different what I think English is is to what English is to people who kind of grew up with it. Um, I'm a Hebrew, a native Hebrew speaker, and I know that people who learned Hebrew who speak to me tend to make interesting choices with their language that are not <laughs> choices that I would make. Um, and, and when you even drill down further, I studied Chinese for a while and I've come to learn very quickly that the language itself changes literally from town to town. Um, so when we think about internationalism in the context of, of, of language, I think international solidarity is far more the point rather than some hope for an international language that will somehow somehow solve all. Because to, in, in the attempt to be international in how we study languages, we flatten the languages that we want to study into an object that is neither the reality nor helps us communicate. It's kind of a, an object outside of time, outside of text, outside of context, that doesn't really help anyone. Rather, maybe the better way forward is to, is to you know, to the extent that we can speak a different language that is not our own, uh, engage with it with with humility and with respect, but also make accessible things for others that they cannot reach. In that sense, I think we'll be very much in the international sphere, um, or in the or in the maybe global sphere if we're not assigning anything detrimental that that term. Uh, but doing so with respect to the to their local context that we that we all find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I think that kind of uh, leads into the next part of this question, which is like whether internationalism and multilingualism or plurilingualism, bilingualism, are are actually just two parts of the same principle, or whether they really are kind of uh, separate separate things to be working at. And I think this relates to actually a lot of the different things that y'all said, like uh, Nicole was mentioning uh, how the translation fits into this. And I think like the, yeah, the way that like uh, concepts move is is actually part of what we need to be thinking about when in relation to uh, this international solidarity, because we need to expect that they're they're expressed in different terms, maybe even within the same language as they move from place to place. And we need to be able to recognize consistencies, which are maybe maybe require us to have a kind of um, uh, theoretical understanding of how we're connecting them. And then also like, like Yotam was saying that like the, um, uh, the the connections actually are not universal in a sense like we're not going to come up with one tool that fits into all the places that actually we need to make connections that are are real and that um, internationally yeah they can maybe seem kind of tenuous right they might not be held together by the the most overlapping fibers in a sense right but that um that's not actually a limitation to how the ideas can move 
And so I think then related to what, what Sonia was mentioning, I think we want to avoid this idea of like the learning another language being a topic or like a subject we sort of study and, and that that's why it needs the context because yeah, we could study, you know, uh, a certain, we could study chemistry or we could study, uh, um, U.S. history or something, and and we're going to limit that to like a certain like ingredients of materials that we're going to look at. But if we're going to study language, it really requires being like with other people, and and that even if we're studying old ingredients like uh, texts from centuries ago in that language, we're going to need to be with people in the present. So I think that that yeah, that leads into this next aspect of like whether they're they're both the, they're the two parts of the same thing or not. And I guess from, from my perspective, it seems like um, we, we actually benefit more by, by separating these into like um, internationalism needs to be something that people in local contexts can see themselves uh, engaging in and can see their own interests uh, reflected in. And that that includes people who don't speak multiple languages and that we can't actually wait until people feel some kind of proficiency in uh, some other form of communication that actually learning to be proficient in our own like uh, first languages is already really challenging when it comes to political concepts and uh, getting people together. And so I think that that setting multilingualism as a bar sometimes actually is an excuse that people use for not engaging in internationalism already. I agree. But at the same time, I think that a lot of times uh, what happens is that multilingualism gets treated as something that's always happening somewhere else that isn't happening here. And if it is, it's only kind of like we've already said, like it's because workers from somewhere else have moved to this place. And so it looks like a a, a problem of, of uh, the the worker population that wasn't in a locale. And that, that's got problems uh, uh, inherent to that, but it's also just not even always true everywhere, where uh, sometimes multilingualism is something that's already been kind of lost somewhere. And what exists there is a sort of homogeneity that is itself a, a post-colonial effect, right? And we we need to see that as a way of like, I guess from my perspective, how do we take those the the master's tools in a sense, right? And what what do we do with that from there? And I, so I think like sometimes we're trying to plant uh, seeds of multilingualism in places that yeah they they maybe don't look like they're supposed to grow anymore. And I think that that's it's different than than the internationalism, which we need to start engaging in um, more Im uh, immediately without like uh, needing to solve such a, um, a conundrum, let's say. So yeah, any anyone else have a opinion on that part of this? I think you kind of hit something that I was already thinking about, because while you were talking about multilingualism, I think there's also this kind of failure to engage with the fact that some places pushed monolingualism and some places still push monolingualism or maybe they push by a supposed bilingualism and then don't recognize um other languages so like in, in thinking about the pushing for bilingualism i'm actually kind of thinking of canada and the fact that it's expected to be french and english but then you get like one of the indigenous ministers who sadly i don't remember her name so maybe someone can chime in with that later um but she's bilingual but not in french <laughs> and so like she gets penalized by people for being bilingual in the wrong way um and i find that kind of frustrating but then also like when you're mentioning this i was thinking of the monolingualism of the united states where it's like um it was 
intentionally pushed because it was a way to homogenize the population. It was a way to Americanize the population. And it was a way to remove these kind of cultural markers from people who were migrants from other places. Um, very often, particularly in my own like research of generally like gifted and talented programs and also special education, you tend to find a lot of stuff talking about how they wanted to Americanize the children, particularly of like uh, German speaking families, of Italian speaking families, of Slavic families. <laughs> and you find this push to force them all to speak English, which kind of decultures them. <laughs> And so I think there's just a kind of refusal to understand, like whenever we're talking about multilingualism as being necessary, which I think it is necessary and very useful, but I don't think it's necessary in the productive sense. Um, I think it's just necessary because that's how the world should work, is that people should have access to being multilingual and it should be simple. <laughs> but like in this push, we tend to put multilingualism on this pedestal of being a kind of capitalist enterprise of being only for people who need it, whatever need means. And it typically is like, is it necessary for work um, <laughs> or is it necessary for study? So there is kind of that. But something else is also like this promotion of acceptable languages. <laughs> so... I'm also kind of stuck at like thinking about how, like where I live, I live in Slovakia. Um, before the like fall of the USSR, children in public schools were taught Russian. <laughs> and um, my students, most of whom tend to be Slovak and most of whom tend to be adults who kind of lived through this, uh, they often will tell me stories about how they were in school and once the USSR, USSR fell, they had teachers who were teaching Russian who were then forced into speaking, or sorry, uh, teaching German <laughs> as their next language, regardless of whether or not they actually spoke German. <laughs> and so like, there was this kind of weird dichotomy of what was an acceptable language and for what purpose that language was deemed acceptable because like under the USSR, obviously Slovak people, then um, Czechs and Slovaks, since they were one, had to learn, uh, you know, Russian in order to engage with this. And then once they didn't have to, they then had to switch over to learning like the next door neighbor, which would be German, but also another mandatory language that's in our schools here is English. <laughs> and like it is required that they learn this. So like there is just kind of like this support for kind of like acceptable languages that are useful in terms of like productivity and business and so on. So it's like here they're expected to be mono, uh, sorry, here they're expected to be multilingual, but like in the US, many of us are expected to be monolingual. <laughs> I guess that, that shows that we have a, a linguistical imperialism <laughs> that it's been much more again in the last de decades. Uh, and it's mostly with English, but we know now that there's other languages that stay on top, like Mandarin. It's just because of the population there, you know, there's a lot of people talking Mandarin. But in this case, I, I would like to point that um, when we talk about, I mean, when we think about languages, most people, for some reason, think just about oral languages or even languages that have an, a phonological alphabet. And in many territories, actually, they were international in other ways because uh, uh, I've learned uh, re recently about the kipus uh, in the Inca Empire. And, and this was, you know, with ropes. They made knots. And that's the way they communicated because the Inca Empire was so big. And I'm sure that it was not just people talking Quechua in this case, but they were you know, in touch with many other languages. Um, and th but this was like kind of an international code system. Uh, they didn't have anything written in the way we know from the European or Western uh, tradition, but they used these ropes, like an international way of doing it. As much as uh, in the US, in the plains, they had the plain hand talk. Uh, so, you know, uh, 
um, among several uh, tribes and indigenous groups, they used hand talk because orally speaking, they, you know, they didn't have that much in common. But instead of struggling with that, they used their hands or even images that they could drawings that they every everybody could understand because that's much more universal. So in this case, I think that um, both when it comes to Esperanto and the the, the Im linguistical imperialism we have with English in the last decades, those are examples exactly of when people are being pushed to learn a certain language to be able to again. Uh, to understand each other in a quicker way. But at the same time, we have, I think it's important that I have been in places, and this is something bilingual and multilingual people do, we mix languages. That's why that's one of the reasons that languages, you know, are, are not um tools that are, are we don't speak like we did in the 15th century. No, nobody does. But that's why because the languages are moving, they're alive. So in some places, like I guess the US, they have pushed this monolingualism, uh, which I think uh, it's awful and it's a genocidal uh, project, of course. Uh, but at the same time, in other territories, it's all, it always have been, they have also tried to push monolingualism. But what has happened is that people have mixed it. And this is something that then we, we notice. For instance, I can just speak about, in my case, Spanish. But um, when we move around, people think that uh, when you when you learn Spanish, you learn Spanish like the standard one, that it's Castellano. But if you move to other territories, thankfully, they have their own dialects. They have their own ways of talking. They have mixed with indigenous languages, not just the words, but the grammar. So for me, as a Spanish-speaking person, um, when I moved to U Yucatan, for instance, they, it's very much mixed with Maya Yucateco. So actually, I could hear Spanish words, but I didn't understand the meaning. It was a very interesting <laughs> experience, which which says that when it comes to the international solidarity, you need time to decode all all the history. And this was a, a colonized place. And a way of resistance actually is both the mixing of languages in a way, adopting this intense of, of linguistical imperialism, but also uh, the revitalization we see now. And as, as Nicole was pointing out, we have some languages that are seen as the important ones, but again, it's the colonizing languages mostly, English, French, German, Spanish, those are colonizing languages. In, in, in when it comes to the international sphere, I'm sure in other contexts happens the same in, in smaller contexts. But you see, I, uh, on especially being immigrants, a lot of us, uh, our own uh, mother tongues or our own uh, first languages are not, um, they are not valued in the same way. And this is something as anarchists, I think we also have to be aware of, right? If we are, I, I'm sure that if we, living in colonized lands or occupied lands, if we are going to learn some languages, we really need to think about what are the most oppressed languages, how are we going to revitalize them, how are we going to join that linguistical resistance. And this comes both when it comes to indigenous languages, but also languages that belong to, to ethnic minorities or even the disabled communities like the, the sign languages everywhere, or even Braille, like the alphabet. You see, it's written, but it's another way of communicating. So when I, I think multilingualism, I think anarchists should think about communication. And we communicate in a lot of different ways, not just with our mouths. I hope that this is clear. <laughs> so so the, actually, this is a wonderful way to that, that we can actually grow this diversity that both colonialism and imperialism have tried to kill the last 500 years. But also, again, that it strengthens the internationalism, I think, right? We can still use all the tools that are not oral to communicate and, and grow uh, this solidarity among us. I, I, have, I just have two comments um, that, that I think might be, might add a little bit to, to this discussion. One is, um, I, in, in, in listening to Sonia, I was reminded of the Chinook language that indigenous people of the 
northern west coast i guess so northern us and into canada into alaska have kind of developed amongst themselves um that is different from their own first nation language uh that they've developed solely for kind of international communication um i think canada today refers to it as a trade language um which it has been used for trade for sure but it but it's from what i know at least has been yet another example of this kind of attempt to create another language uh, and has been successful for thousands of years until colonists did what colonists do um, <laughs> in, in, in creating communication across cultures, across social groups, across um, First Nations. That's one thing. Another thing that I think maybe creates undue complication here, but I think it's still interesting and relevant, especially for English speakers, is to recognize how our own anarchist and, so, and radical socialist theory has been influenced by language blindness. And I'm reminded here of Kenyon Zimmer's work. Uh, his book is called At Immigrants Against the State, where he shows that in the U.S., a lot of the anarchist um, texts and theories that we associate with the anarchist movement in the U.S. has been um, ignored. The, 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 the scholarly um, literature, at least, has ignored immensely Yiddish, German, and Italian anarchists who, who spoke and read and wrote in Yiddish, Italian, and German in the U.S. and in Canada, and it's actually there that the majority of the conversation around anarchism and radical socialism has happened in the um, 19th and 20th century, and and that really opened my my eyes to how complicated um, this kind of conversation on languages is in the context of anarchism, and how uh, biased a lot of people who are interested in anarchism generally just really have a good in, a, a, a good hearted interest how biased their their interpretations might be because they just don't see that language bias and I, and if you even go a step further we can talk about yiddish which was again a very important language in in writing anarchism in the 20th century and that is at least grammatically ancient hebrew with german and russian and also some polish and a little bit of lithuanian and 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 you get into a whole mess of of languages grammars and 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 and, and real internet international uh, connections that are embedded in the language that, that, that we speak. So I think that's really important for us to also kind of as people who ascribe to certain anarchist principles to also look, take a good look at ourselves and how we understand ideas around us and why, where we read them, why we read them in those places and how might biases in those kinds of things affect how we understand uh, the concepts that we use. I'd also just point to the fact that like, in the U.S., at least, there are a number of places that have Yiddish in um, in their English. So, like, in the Midwest, we often use a lot of Yiddish phrases, and many people don't even recognize this. And even though we're doing that, like, we're still overlooking it completely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yiddish is, is really embedded in, in contemporary English in many ways. That, And I oftentimes... Go, uh, excuse me, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, definitely. It, that, it makes me think about how um, one thing that happens with, in the U.S. is that, uh, and, and I mean, I have a tendency maybe to just uh, accuse all Anglophones of this around the world, but like what definitely happens in the U.S. is that people engage with uh, a translation and that there's nothing wrong with engaging with the translation. But one thing that happens is the actual work of, of even doing the translating is also lost in this. No one recognizes the work of translators as being part of this. And so like, not only is the, the kind of respect for the origin of those ideas and the way that they articulated it lost, but the actual work done to help communicate that to, the, to other people is lost. And it's sort of just not only assumed in a very privileged way and entitled way, it's also like a way of not seeing the actual like diversity that is there, like and, and assuming diversity is a kind of thing to establish or create or instill when like I think that that's that's one of the effects of of that kind of homogeneity is like we, we sort of see uh, a flatness of things that are not actually as flat as they, they maybe appear. And um, 
but but I, I know that there's some some maybe strong languages and I think we or some some strong opinions about this and I think that we uh have have touched on this a little bit. So relating to the the idea of these these kinds of uh tools for being between languages or for communicating um uh in spite of these these differences or like uh uh, efforts to overcome them like what are what are the opinions uh that y'all have around uh things like esperanto and um recently i've encountered interlingua which is like uh kind of um the idea is it's it's composed of things that are coming from uh multiple like common uh, romance languages and uh and also with with english and so it's bizarrely kind of uh comprehensible to people who maybe themselves um uh, don't don't think they speak that language um but yeah what what do you what are your opinions of those things not you know like, like we said like not abstractly but actually like today like right like like uh given our internet culture or given the fact that like uh why do we even know about those things right there, there is some kind of uh some sort of relevance that he has even informed us about them and kind of like we're saying, like um, they are things that crop up in uh, anarchist uh, ideas uh, and anarchist uh, internationalism. So, yeah. Uh, I've been kind of frustrated by Esperanto since about fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so that's almost like three decades of frustration with a constructed auxiliary language. Um, mostly because like, you know, in fifth grade, I was going like, why am I learning this? Why can't I just learn German? Or like, why can't I learn something that is relevant to my community? Like the community of people I grew up around was like, you know, um, mostly people who were born in the US, but then you had a lot of people who still had a lot of connection to their German, like family roots to a lot of people who still had a lot of connection to um, Czech and Slovak. Uh, Polish was another really big community around me. Um, <laughs> almost the entirety of the V4, so it's almost unsurprising that I ended up here. Uh, <laughs> but like, I found it really frustrating that we could not actually engage with things that people were genuinely using. Um, like, or sign language, like, why couldn't we have done, like, American sign language in my fifth grade class? Like, why were we learning Esperanto? So, like, I've literally just been so frustrated by Esperanto since I was in fifth grade. I am not a fan of um, constructed languages, personally. Uh, there is another one that you could include here because there is a pan-Slavic language, which tries to tie, like, Czech, Slovak, um, Bulgarian, Polish, and so like all the Slavic languages um, <laughs> into one. So there, there's another constructed language for you to kind of investigate if you're interested. <laughs> but I've always just found them kind of frustrating because it's kind of this way of removing things from a context and trying to make them like, I have no problem with making things intelligible, but I do struggle with the idea of making them intelligible on someone else's terms. Like, I think it's very frustrating to not engage with what little I can find of, the, like, the Slovak and Czech anarchist movements, um, like, historically. And, you know, do this and be like, well, I'm going to do this through a constructed language <laughs> that makes it, you know, easier and more intelligible rather than actually engaging with the Czech anarchists or the Slovak anarchists or even the Polish anarchists. Like, I find it very frustrating that we're not engaging with them on their terms. <laughs> and um, it kind of reminds me of like a book I read that I absolutely love. It's not anarchist at all, but it is this book called Midnight Robber. And it's written in a Jamaican dialect. And so for me, who did not grow up with a Jamaican dialect at all, or did not grow up with the Jamaican Creole at all, it was a very big learning curve in the first couple chapters. But once I started getting into it, it started like, you know, it was communicating itself to me. Like I had to understand that book on its own terms. <laughs> and I kind of appreciate that. So, like, if someone were to put that back into standard American English, I think I'd be really frustrated. <laughs> but I also feel like I'd be equally as annoyed if they put it into Esperanto. <laughs> I 
I'd probably be more annoyed, honestly. <laughs> Can I break the order? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've so you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm in no way expert on the history of Esperanto, and I've tried to learn it for about a week, and then just decided that it was a, just not useful in any way, and moved on to the next thing. Um, but I, my impression has always been that. To the extent that you can reach a language that is kind of encompassing of the globe, I guess, you can do that by either forcing it on someone, which English is a good example of that, or by trying to create something artificial. Um, those attempts at, at creating artificial languages usually are really just um, covering up for a blind spot, which is thinking that I have some sort of a universal take on what language should be, and that my universality is kind of encompassing of the whole world. And that's, of course, never the case. Um, you, there, it's you're, you're going to be hard pressed to 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 even create a grammatical, uh, literally one grammatical structure that can be in some way encompassing of the globe so there's, there's just no way that's it's, it's a practice in futility uh, but even if you were able to do that and again i return here to the example of english the moment that you um force language on a region that region is going to fight back and it's going to fight back not only by protecting its own indigenous languages but also by changing your language <laughs> changing your language dr dramatically english is spoken differently everywhere what that teaches us is that languages are not just technical tools to convey information like um, like 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 produce that is you know passed between the trader and the consumer, but are rather objects of love. They're a thing that people find identity and love and care in and 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 they develop and cultivate and and live through. And so the very act of trying to somehow create an, a, a linguistical object that is outside of people's lives and also convince people to adopt it, well, even if they will, they'll make it their own very quickly and every region that you would do this in will have a different language in no time. So maybe a better route, a more practical route for anarchists would be to um, engage with other languages with, with care and with respect, and also invite people who are interested in, in your language and, 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 and giving them comfortable space, hospitable space to make a lot of mistakes and kind of stumble their way into, into your linguistical home. Um, I think those practices are far more effective in creating some sort of an international community than trying to create a language outside of, of, of people's experiences and expecting them to adopt it. Along with the fact that in creating that language, you're still implementing a lot of your own bias and perceptions of what a language looks like. So, you know, uh, Esperanto tends to pull a lot from like what Latin languages uh, doesn't really consider the fact that Cynic languages are a thing. <laughs> um, doesn't engage with like South Asia in any capacity. Uh, it kind of misses out that there's a whole chunk of the planet somewhere. <laughs> so, like, yeah, like again, I'm I, I've always just been really frustrated by Esperanto. It's hard for me to just understate how much it annoys me. Um, but also, like, I like constructed languages as a concept because, like, I do like you know I am nerdy enough to really like the linguistics of how people, particularly linguistics and, uh, or sorry, linguists and linguistic anthropologists put together uh, constructed languages for fictional universes, like Klingon, for example. But like no one's enforcing Klingon on everyone, uh, which would be really bizarre. <laughs> like I, I find, I think that would just be something that people would push back on, but also like it would just be a really strange world that we live in where the constructed language that people have decided we should all speak is Klingon. And for some reason, like people don't seem to see the same issues in like other 
constructed languages where it's like if you say the same thing about Esperanto people tend to kind of push back and be like oh no this is really useful if you say the same thing about like interlingua or pan-slavic language like people tend to push back and explain like no these are actually really useful tools and it's like yeah but is it like is it more useful for me to learn pan-slavic language and all the wonky grammar that comes along with it or would it just be easier for me to learn slovak and kind of navigate polish through you know that lens where it's like you know like i can kind of read some polish i know some of the pronunciations and if i can say the words i can at least understand some of them because they share roots similar with like my interactions with italian and spanish like <laughs> I can kind of guess Spanish based on some of what I know of Italian. Um, and I'm not like struggling in that capacity. I mean, like I'm not understanding Spanish on Spanish's terms, but I am still trying to engage with it and be like, okay, hey, what does this mean? Because to me, this is how I understand it because I speak this language. <laughs> so I kind of don't think you have that opportunity either with constructed languages to really be like, what are you saying by this? Like, what do you mean by that? Because, like, there's supposed to be this expected intelligibility. <laughs> I guess uh, um, it makes me think of kind of like Nicole was saying there, like, not being against uh, the concept of this. And maybe maybe it relates back to, like we've said before, uh, these, these sort of um, practices of multilingual practices or, or practices of transcending uh, regional boundaries, uh, if they're coming out of these direct connections that are being made, those tools are not looking for relevance, right? So something that, that seems to be accomplishing that same function, if it's divorced from just being a idealistic dream, right? And so maybe, maybe like a, a lot of these things just relate to other problems we see come up in anarchism of just a strong uh, kind of idealist tendency, right? Of, of kind of inventing ideas and looking for a place to put those ideas or coming up with tools and looking for a place to put them, which uh, yeah, maybe is a problem we share with, with Marxists also, right? And so I think that um, we shouldn't be against the idea that, the, that in context, new kind of, um, constructed solutions could establish themselves, right? That, that in practice, uh, these kind of incidental min blending languages could start to become something more formalized. And that today, you know, we could maybe become aware of that happening a lot sooner before it's kind of anthropological, right? Uh, we see that in the way that like, um, uh, English is, you know, uh, we don't we don't really need to worry about coming up with a, an idealized kind of uh, international language since we're sort of forced to use English in that way. And so um, I think that's that's related to this idea of like um, maybe maybe how how that affects different people in different places. And specifically, I'm wondering from y'all's perspective, since I mean, obviously, this conversation is happening in English. Uh, what what do you think are those effects? And and I'm thinking not just like, you know, universally, obviously, but like if we kind of to break this down into three categories of like people who who uh, English is their first language or let's say their dominant language uh, versus people who speak English as a secondary language and people who don't have access to English and, and who are, yeah, live in this world where English is forced on us. And so there's uh, sort of uh, separate from that that whole experience. Um, if y'all have any reflections or or thoughts or yeah, even personal takes on that, <laughs> I'd be really interested. I guess I get to be the weird one as the um, the one person out of the three of us whose first language is English, <laughs> because like you know, it's like when I first left the United States, or rather when I first left the Anglophone world, because when I first left the US, I ended up in Australia. And guess what? <laughs> they also speak English. Um, <laughs> so like when I first actually left the Anglophone world, like I did have a huge learning curve, where it's like, logically, in my head, I understood that people spoke languages that weren't English. Like, I know this, it was a thing and it was in my brain, like I acknowledged this, but it wasn't until I was actually in those places <laughs> 
that I actually kind of had it hit me in the face. Um, because again, like I come from the rural Midwest, <laughs> like, you know, English is pretty much thrust upon us. There are people who speak other languages, like my family also spoke German. So duh, I knew that people spoke other languages. But the way that the US presents other countries is that everyone will speak English. Like when you hear about them, when you see their presentation in the media, they are never really engaging with people who speak whatever language is local to those places. They are almost always engaging with someone who speaks English. And so you kind of get barraged with media that tells you that the world will speak English. No matter where you go, you will speak English and everyone will talk to you in English. So even though like logically in my brain, I knew people did not speak English, like it was kind of like a wake up call at the same time. <laughs> like when I first moved to, um, like the first place I moved to for work was Taiwan. And while I was there, that's where I um, really started picking up a lot of like Mandarin Chinese. And, you know, like, I had to engage with them on their terms. Like, while I was there, uh, a lot of the people who were close to my age, um, so, <laughs> like, when I was there, I was probably in my late 20s or so, but a lot of the people I talked to who were around my age didn't speak English at all. Uh, it was a lot of, like, elderly people. And so I typically was sitting around with a lot of, like, people in their 70s and 80s because... Those are the people I could actually communicate with. And they were the ones who were sitting there helping me learn Mandarin Chinese because, you know, like they wanted to share stuff with me and they wanted to kind of not just, um, they liked having the idea of being able to talk to someone else just because like sometimes like the elderly often get overlooked. <laughs> And this seems to be a strange concept that I've noticed happening in a lot of places. Old people just like to be talked to, and I think that's great. <laughs> Which I think is another whole other topic we could get into, where it's like we need to actually start engaging with the elderly and, in, and people of different ages. But anyway, it's like, so I had that whole experience kind of like for the first time. And ever since, I have not lived in a country that speaks English as its dominant language. Like they do have people who obviously speak English, but I also find it very much a struggle <laughs> to communicate with people, even if I do try to learn the language, because I've always tried to learn the language of where I live, because I just think that's the right thing to do. <laughs> so like I have also lived in Italy, and so I have picked up a lot of Italian. My partner is Italian. And at the same time, like, I know I'm not fluent in Italian. <laughs> um, when I was using Duolingo, because I know we're going to get on the topic of apps, like, I only ever got one great sentence and I have nowhere to use it because it sounds like a bizarre mafia threat, which is la tua anatra e la mia cena. Your duck is my dinner. Where am I going to use that? <laughs> And so, like, even though I would try to communicate with people in Italian, not using that sentence, because obviously I'm not going to go to the local bar or cafe or whatever and just try to use that on the person waiting on me. But, like, any time I would try to communicate, people would immediately notice my Italian was bad and run away. <laughs> and I had no idea, like, what to do at that point other than just wait. Because they would just, if your Italian wasn't good, they just assumed you spoke English, which in my case is a correct assumption. But then they would just go off and like either hide <laughs> or try to find the one person who did happen to speak English in the vicinity. And I didn't need that. <laughs> and I found that really kind of detrimental to my own learning of the language because like, I didn't want them to prioritize my language over theirs, but they kept doing it to me for me. <laughs> so I kind of feel like that's something. And I have the same issue here in Slovakia too, um, to less of an extent, because like a lot of people um, will try to engage with you. Although the bigger thing is that most people, if you fuck up, still tend to get mad at you for some reason. <laughs> or 
Like, they get frustrated with you that you're not communicating correctly, and you're just kind of going there like, I'm really sorry, but I don't know what the Slovak is for, like, this specific form I need to fill out. Like, <laughs> so I do kind of feel that, like, as a person whose first language is English, a lot of people assume that I don't want to engage with the language because I they expect like I was taught, that I should expect that everyone speaks English. Which I think is a very weird thing because I also live as an immigrant here where they're constantly telling me that I need to learn the local language and I have to learn the local language and so on. Like they have this whole belief and like these two things don't really mesh where it's like they both expect that I should speak the local language but also they do this thing where they enforce upon me that I need to talk to someone in English. <laughs> and I find it very strange. Well, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, having English as the, let's see, third language. Um, I have to admit that, again, the last years, decades, I think that people are not aware of all the ideology and uh the political and economical ideologies that comes with English, because you're speaking about English, but most people, when they think English is the U.S., is the, I'm sorry to tell you people, is the gringo English, right? Uh, so um, so that, that means that with that English comes a lot of culture. And in this case, the culture among a lot of stuff, but yeah, when I think about the, the the English we have now, it has to do with a way of living that people, uh, like like Nicole was saying, people actually expect a, wherever you do travel, in places where English is not a language whatsoever, in the context, they expect us to use it because it's the easy thing to do, and uh, you know, both with um, media and movies and fast food and all this stuff, everybody can, at a certain degree, some words, right? And now if we talk, of course, music and all the, well, with the internet, everybody has had access now to, you know, uh, uh, think about, well, uh, have ideas that comes also from, from the U.S. because you're learning that the that language, I mean, it's specific from the U.S. what we hear the most, um, and in 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 that matter, actually, I deny <laughs> to, to use English in contexts where that's not one of the local languages. Um, I rather point or use body language. You know, as an anarchist, I think no, I'm an anti-colonial and anti-imperialist. Why should I be using English? And yes, I can use it, but I, I also choose actively not to <laughs> uh, and again also in in colonized places but i know that again is this balance everybody wants to understand each other and especially among uh, uh, adults i think it's very interesting now nicole opened for duolingo uh, i'm so sorry i don't like those apps exactly because it's constructions that makes no sense Right. It's it's sentences that somebody thinks that grammatically speaking are easy, but it's sentences that probably we will never use when I, I speak fluently four languages four, And uh, when I every time I want to learn a new language, what I do is that I learn like kids do. Right. Because if you think everybody, I mean, uh, uh, children uses seven, eight years actually to be able to have a functional use of their own first languages. Right. Or second or if, if they're bilingual or whatever. But why is expected that adults are going to learn languages in the most unnatural way? Uh, learning sentences that are, have no context. Um and actually, when I used the fourth language, that it's Norwegian, I started you making my own sentences with everyday things I had to do. And I remember clearly that the first sentence I learned is, "Can I have a stamp?" Because I was going. <laughs> this was a time when people still send letters uh, physically. So that's where I learned. And of course, the problem is always that suddenly they think. They they think they assume that you can the language and I didn't. So actually, the person just answered a lot of things that I didn't understand. 
but um, but at least we communicate and I get my stamp. So I, I, I continue learning, you know, with, with children's books in Norwegian because, again, I denied completely to use English. Everybody speaks English here in this country and Scandinavia in general. I didn't want to because if you keep using a, a language that it's not uh, belongs to the context, it's really difficult, actually. And this is something that it's called this linguistical immersion. That's why I think uh, using apps is so difficult. And in this case, um, I think we have a richness of languages everywhere. Uh, I'm not a fan of, again, apps, but YouTube have a lot of great people there trying to, you know, where you can also learn. The thing is that, again, to learn a language, you need to have somebody to speak or use it with, right? That's the thing. You cannot just, I mean, I could, I, I, I've been a dream of, of learning Gaelic. Yeah, that's wonderful. But of course, if I don't go to, you know, Southwest Ireland in this case, it will be difficult because nobody speaks Gaelic in Norway. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's somebody, but not that I know. So the thing is that, again, when it comes to this, if it's detrimental having English as this so-called universal language, I think as anarchists, we actually have a moral duty to deny <laughs> to do it, and we are still doing it here. But again, we could have done it in, yeah, in other languages, and I think people, act, uh, like Nicole was saying, we need to to try to learn what in the context we are in. And even uh, even more being more anti-colonial, try to learn the indigenous languages in the place you are at. I think that that could be a, a, an ethical stand that anarchists do, actually, right? And to, to, to come to just to break that hierarchical linguistical imperialism that we have now with English going on. My take is much more uh, feelings based. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I say this quite a lot to native English speakers that I engage with daily because I'm in, in a primarily English speaking space right now in, in West Canada. Um, I am not myself when I speak English. I am not. You are right now talking to a version of myself that is vastly different in, in in demeanor in tone in vocabulary um, there's always going and th that's never going to change there's always going to be a distance between myself and the person who speaks English in an English speaking context um, there is an otherness that is embedded in the practice of going to another language because my my native language is embedded in my identity. And there are things that I just cannot translate. It's not only terminology that I that sometimes is very difficult, if not impossible, to really understand. Um, but even the sound of letters that I find <laughs> different. So... I've practiced for many years to develop this quasi West Coast um, accent that I use now. But oftentimes we have this little game that we play where someone asks me if I can speak with a, with a Hebrew accent, if I can speak English with a Hebrew accent. And I can, but it takes a lot of work because I've conditioned myself not to do it anymore. <laughs> but if I speak to you now in a Hebrew accent, it is very, very different, right? It was very different because letters sound differently. Now, I understand that this now, right now, feels closer to a native English speaker, but it's further away from me. It is a, dis it is a step outside of myself that I have to take in order to be in an English speaking world. Um... I think it is important to notice these things. I think it's important to understand the kinds of sacrifices. I, it might be a too harsh of a word, but maybe sacrifices that not non-native speakers have to make in order to engage with you, you being the native speaker, in order to be with you in the conversation. I think it's, it's as an ethic of care, is something that maybe we should think more 
um, deeply about? I, th I think that, um, so, so from, from all of your comments, I have sort of some different things to, to reply, but to start with what, what, uh, you were saying right there, I think that, um, there, you know, maybe to share, share my own sort of emotional experience, um, I sort of feel kind of lost in between all of them where I don't like, yeah, I get what you're saying. Like you're not there in the English, but like, I, I feel not there in the English. Like so much of my experiences, so much of my knowledge is not in English and I cannot share it with the people I'm closest to. And that, that doesn't just mean like, Oh, it's in this other language. And that's <laughs> like, I, I, in this weird way, like, yeah, it, I, I, it, it relates back to what we were saying before with the internationalism and the multilingualism, like internationalism feels like, like my home. It doesn't feel like a principle. It is just a fact of my life because even to the people I'm closest to, I'm the most like, uh, um, like, uh, foreign thing that they encounter. You know, because I'm not not foreign from another place, but I am formed by things from other places. And, and that, yeah, in the same way, maybe anarchists can relate to being the only anarchist in a space or something. I think a lot of times, like, uh, if you are the only multilingual person in a space, you become a kind of parlor trick, uh, just uh, someone who's supposed to perform this thing and like, do this like uh um like fulfill this myth that people have of like how you just go from one thing to the other so i can really relate to what you're saying there but also like i don't feel like i know where to find the other part of it and so multilingualism also feels like um and and this relates to what, what sonia was saying before i actually have a pretty hard time blending the languages uh i'm a lot more comfortable if we can just pick one and we can we can deal with that one i'll make whatever mistakes or I'll, I'll deal with that. I, I have a hard time switching all the time and that uh, I'm pretty comfortable with whatever conversation it is in the three languages that I speak, but like, I'd rather just know, okay, that's what we're going to speak and we're not going to jump around. I have a really hard time with that. And I think that that relates to, um, uh, again, to sort of share my personal experience, I don't find, you know, um, Duolingo and other apps like that are obviously flawed. But from my experience as a as someone who spoke English first, um, kind of like we're like, I, and I think this is what Nicole was saying too, like, and we mentioned this earlier, things seem kind of flat. So they seem flat from your home. But even when you go other places and you expect like, this will have to be different things have flattened that space for you and people are willing to collapse it right in front of you to make it as homogenous as it's it's like we're all part of it in this way and so even when you assume you're encountering innocent bystanders this same reproduction of this like uh, mass uh, uh, dominant culture reproduces itself and so like um my experience of not exactly Duolingo, because I, I definitely learned languages before these apps existed. So using, you know, other kinds of grammar worksheets and stuff like that, <laughs> I actually learned a lot from how English is is really expression based and that grammar has very little to do with it and that actually learning a lot of grammar to help me understand other languages was enormously helpful. And learning kind of structural patterns from that actually taught me a lot back about English that no one had ever taught me about English. And that actually it kind of as you know, I've lived longer being multilingual, it seems just like actually, we don't know a lot about English, right? People do English, but people who speak it don't know as much about it. And this goes back again to the internationalism is I think also, it helps us to learn more about our own first languages or our own dominant languages by having other people communicate to us with them. Because we don't always see them. We can't encounter them in that way. And that maybe that's, you know, um, to kind of move into just yeah, um, uh, the full conversation about Duolingo here, maybe something that could easily be overlooked by these is actually the sort of dabbling um, and the the sort of um, just clicking on a language to do it for a couple of days. And 
that I am very, you know, I discount that to a, in a big way. I, I hate this sort of uh, general, uh, I'm just into languages and I don't ever actually learn how to talk to anyone. Um, but at the same time, I think for a kind of, you know, gaining a multifaceted perspective, maybe there is something to that, that like actually being able to encounter even a really fakely fabricated sentence in another language, um, it, it shows us things about uh, ourselves that maybe we, it, it's a, it's a kind of mirror in a way that we, we maybe uh, are, are also using nowadays. Um, so that, that kind of, yeah, to open up the question around like, um, why you think these things, th these things like Duolingo are so popular and what your own experiences are and, or what you've heard from other people who've tried to use them. Um, like, I mean, I'm, I'm a language teacher, so obviously like almost all of my students have, you know, used some form of these apps. Uh, I say Duolingo cause that's what I reference in the, in the column. And, you know, that's the one that's kind of most popular everywhere. And again, like it's kind of when I was, uh, uh, in the writing workshop and we're speaking in Spanish, I encounter people having this exact same experience, uh, trying to learn English who are native Spanish speakers and seeing the limitations of Duolingo. So I think that in a weird way, technology has forced itself to be this intermediary between almost wherever you're starting and wherever you're trying to go. And so in, in a certain way, like the popularity isn't something we choose. It just is a fact, right? Like, I mean, as someone who works with people trying to learn languages, whether Duolingo is helpful or not, it, we have to deal with it. It's like a thing we have to wrestle with in this uh, reality. So yeah, what, are, what about y'all's personal experiences with it or why you think it's, it's, it is so popular? I'm just going to go back a little bit because when you were talking about how learning other languages helped you understand English more, I had the same thing, even though I grew up speaking German. So like I kind of grew up speaking English and German together. Even though I grew up speaking that, I ended up kind of cheating my way through high school and taking German classes so I would get easy A's. And in those classes, I was learning like German grammar, like directly learning German grammar for the first time. So like I had already kind of had the German grammar in my head <laughs> because my grandparents had been teaching me German as a small kid. And so I already kind of knew it, but like I didn't know why we did stuff like that. And I remember the first time that like a teacher taught me how to use the words wer and wem in German, which are just who and whom. And then I suddenly understood how it was that we were supposed quote, supposed to, unquote, use who and whom in English, <laughs> because the grammatical structure is pretty much very similar. It's like, ah, oh, so that's why every time I hear that. So like, those were kinds of th like connections I've actually started making a lot in, like, just understanding English, <laughs> because like, I, I never really learned these grammar patterns. Like, even though we have direct instruction in school about how to use it, it I never, it, it never connected until I started lear like learning how grammar worked in other languages. And it's like, ah, okay, I get it now. <laughs> so I find that very interesting that you also had a very similar <laughs> experience in how like, you know, our understandings of English. And I'm, it almost makes me wonder how other people kind of understand their own languages. But like, f going back to the Duolingo thing, though, it's like, I have tried so many times to use the app and partly I cannot use it because I'm ADHD <laughs> because it requires going back and doing something that I find immensely tedious and incredibly dull and superbly boring <laughs> and forcing myself to do this. And I don't understand in my own brain. I do not understand how anyone can maintain a streak at all <laughs> because it's just so immensely dull and in trying to learn like different languages, like I find it very perplexing because like you just cannot learn some of these things. At least I don't think I can learn some of these things through those apps. So like my own personal experience has just been like trying to use it. Um, I think the most successful thing I've ever found it useful for was like how to write the Korean alphabet <laughs> and how to understand the Korean alphabet. like. 
that's it. That's the most value I've ever gotten out of Duolingo. And the only reason I ended up doing that was so I could kind of help some of my current students who are all Korean children, um, <laughs> like right now. So I've, that's like the most value I've ever gotten out of it. I haven't heard any positive stuff about Duolingo from most people. I think most people tend to find it very frustrating um, that I have talked to, not that everyone does, because obviously someone is using it. Um, <laughs> but I also kind of have been listening to other people, like I forget which podcast I was actually listening to, and it was um, someone who comes from Hawaii, so like a native Hawaiian. Uh, I wish I could remember his name. If I happen to, I will put it in the show notes. But they were talking about how Duolingo provides a platform for learning like indigenous languages, but then doesn't actually engage with in the people who speak those languages. Um, it doesn't really provide a lot of resources for the maintenance of those languages or for making them more accessible. I think even at looking at du Duolingo before uh, recording, I saw that they also had Navajo. And it makes me wonder how much support they give to Navajo people or any Native Hawaiians, which I know they also have a Native Hawaiian course, but it's like, how much support do they actually give to these communities to maintain these? And who gets to access those? And that was a really big key part that that podcast was talking about, which is like, who is actually accessing this? Is it the people who want to maintain and retain or relearn their like language, like their cultural language? Or is it people who are on the outside? And it's like, they, they said that like people on the outside, it's not inherently a bad thing. Like, they don't mind. But if it's only people on the outside who have access to these tools, who have access to these resources, or who are benefiting from providing these courses, because some of these courses do come with payments because they do have ads and they do run um, like subscription models. And it's like, who is benefiting from it? And so that's another question that I often kind of stop to ask, especially after having heard that, because like it was something that, you know, Duolingo kind of presents itself as a community of languages, as a place where there are lots of spaces for people to learn different languages and to promote different ones. But another thing to consider is the fact that they still don't even have like other languages that are real on the platform <laughs> like they are happily putting high valerian on there uh again to mention klingon klingon is on the platform and while i have no issue with these like fictional constructed languages i find it really immensely frustrating that they aren't providing the same kind of resources to putting actual languages on the platform <laughs> like there is czech but there is no slovak and while there are like 10 million Czech people, they're kind of discounting 5 million people because that isn't there. Like they're not looking to put those resources anywhere. And I think this is just a broader issue with social media as a whole, because social media often finds itself running in like one language with like maybe a couple other dominant languages, German, French, and Spanish, <laughs> or maybe like Mandarin and Russian sometimes, and then just discounts everyone else. <laughs> And I kind of feel the same way about these apps, too. I mean, my own experience, um, I don't like these apps because they have a very, uh, um, in addition to what Nicole was mentioning about, okay, who benefits from this, economically speaking, but it also, it's very behavioristic. I mean, it's, it's a completely awful way of of learning. This is not how we learn anyway. So, so to me, um, uh, trying to, I've never used Duolingo, but I know people who has, and I mean, it might be valuable if you want to learn to, if you want to increase or expand your vocabulary, I guess, but then you have to be patient because yeah, you have to go through these stages and get all these stars or whatever it is. I don't know. It makes no sense. Uh, that's why I think that, uh, it's it's so narrow 
the the value it has actually to to be able not again not to just learn a language but the culture that sustains it it's gone the context is gone uh and you're just you know actually it, it's a, a little bit like a parrot i mean you are you are repeating certain sentences and that's it i mean what are you going to do with it and i think as an anarchist uh, i i I deny to think that grammatically speaking, the sentences you get are especially anti-capitalist. I'm not going to I'm going to go to the Olingo just to check. <laughs> what kind of sentences you get? Okay. I like my blue dress, for instance. I mean, I, I'm never going to say something like that anyway, right? So even even the, <laughs> the content that they are that they are um, basing these languages on, again, it has an ideology behind as well i guess and it, it you cannot construct and you cannot develop the language because you i think uh, the people i know that has used duolingo they think that the funniest part of it is to get the the stars or the streaks but when i ask them okay but are you actually learning to say something valuable i mean if you meet a person in the language you're learning are you able to use it and of course they don't. So and then what is the point? <laughs> I mean, and that's your duck is my dinner. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, when are you going to say that? So <laughs> so again, when you when you intertwine in this behavioristic, capitalistic uh, motivations behind these apps, I don't I, I don't see what actually people are learning. And I'm sure that uh, people that have used this uh, thinks it's interesting and it's fun and sure. But again, how does it help the international solidarity? What are you learning to express with these apps, the content in itself? And again, I I like to be skeptical, but I don't think it's especially anti-capitalist in any shape or form. So uh, this is also something we have to think about. I mean... I think that, that to learn the languages, sure, it can be valuable at, until some extent to use these apps. But the best thing is that go and find, go and find and meet people that actually can use the language and, you know, start creating communities, not just transactional uh, relationships saying, oh, I would love to learn English and you can teach me whatever it might be. No, not like that. But actually with with the 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 mean and the goal uh, of of creating communities out of the process of learning these languages, actually, yes, to build international solidarity. I think that the you know, anarchists we we want that the means are the same that the ends. The same happens when we are learning languages. Then, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use a diff a little bit of a different take here. Um, I've also failed with Duolingo miserably. <laughs> on multiple occasions i tried to um learn german from scratch i tried to improve my uh mandarin skills and i've also tried yiddish and have made i have I'm, i've gone zero out of three i've failed miserably on all three and i've not been able to um maintain the streak and i agree with with many of the critiques that were raised here um i think to a large extent duolingo is kind of one of the better examples of the move towards gamification in 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 tech where every problem can be solved through making a game out of it and well you know that's not the case but my kind of hot take here i guess or lukewarm take here is that <laughs> duolingo in its has 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 and other apps of that of that genre um are attempting to respond to a very important problem in language learning, which I think, Carl, it was actually represented in a way in the tech in your text, which is what kind of gatekeeping is associated with language learning. And one of the gatekeeping mechanisms that I think, if I remember correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you've mentioned is if you want to learn language, you have to go ahead and travel to the place where that language is spoken. And so that kind of says, well, if you can't afford that, then you don't deserve to learn this language. And that really resonated with me because I've, I've had that experience. When I was learning Mandarin, that's exactly what I was told. Uh, if you're not willing to relocate for a number of years 
to mainland China. Don't ex don't even try. Don't even go there. Don't learn anything. Don't. It's impossible. What we as 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 anarchists may learn from this is that the response to the barriers to language learning, that's where we can come in and offer um, community minded anti capitalist anti colonial solutions. And I think Sonia has alluded to to such solutions like commu creating community of of, of uh, speakers. That's great. Uh, we can imagine a whole host of other of other practices, but it is worth remembering that, and this is kind of the place where I think Duolingo does the most harm, is that learning a language, any language, is a very difficult, embarrassing, and awkward practice. It's that's just part of the program. It is what it is. Learning a language, and anyone you know, we're all we've all been there. Even if you're very good at it, is an enormously awkward practice of stumbling into the unknown, making horrible mistakes as you go along. Um, capitalist ventures like Duolingo and others tend to tell you that there is a solution out of this, that you can access a language without stumbling into it. Well, you can't. It doesn't work. You have to stumble into it and make a whole lot of mistakes and get really, really embarrassed and kind of scared. This is just what language learning is. It's beautiful. It's chaotic. It's weird. What we as anarchists can do in our respective languages and the language that we are confident in is to, um, and I'm already sound like a, like a broken record by this point, but to open spaces and and invite embarrassment, invite awkwardness, invite making mistakes, because that's how you access language. That's it. There's no other way. Yeah, I'm definitely going to second that because I'm also going to put out the fact that like I have tried a number of times because I really want to find a place to comfortably learn Slovak and not in a class because first and foremost, I hate classes. Um, I am a very strange person who was, you know, once a teacher, would like to abolish schools, do not see a value in language classes, as particularly as they're structured now. I have tried going to the local, like, um, language school and learning Slovak, and I find that I have been inundated with so much grammar that now I have, like, a paralysis about like trying to say something because I'm sitting there going, okay, we have six cases, seven cases, which one do I choose? And like, I would have no problem otherwise, just like screwing up, like making those mistakes. But I find that like people here don't really want to offer like spaces to do that. I also find like I have suggested to our local um, anarcho-syndicalist union that they could provide space for language learning so that way we could do like language exchanges so that people could talk in like you know different target languages whichever ones they want to use and be able to teach ones to actually build like a, a diverse community um <laughs> it's something they haven't wanted to do uh they either kind of enforce english as the second language for everyone or like whatever the the lingua franca should be for everyone or they enforce Slovak and they don't want to even interact with like other migrants like they barely want to interact with me <laughs> and like I at least speak one of those languages and I do have an interest in trying to learn the other um, but they also just don't want to interact with like we have a bunch of people from like Vietnam we have a whole bunch of people from Iran and like they don't want to even interact with many of these communities. We've actually had a huge, obvious uh, increase in the population of Ukrainians. Ukraine is right next door. Um, and like they don't even really want to create spaces for us to share these languages. And so like I really wish more anarchist spaces in particular, but more spaces in general, would actually be willing to create spaces for us to share our culture, share our language, share our like uh, knowledge 
instead of kind of like finding excuses for why we can't do it. So like often I get like, we don't have enough resources and you're going, well, you're never going to. <laughs> so it's like, I kind of wish that more people would actually engage on this front too. So it's like kind of in line with that, making mistakes, screwing up and creating a comfortable environment to do that. Like you actually have to do something instead of like making these excuses. And I find that like too many groups just want to make these excuses and do whatever is easiest. So yeah, maybe to touch on like the more concrete proposal here, I think is like not this vague, like a uh, refrain that we should, you know, feel like uh, guilty of repeating of like, you know, form communities, get together in groups. I think that when we're talking about this trust and this comfort, that that's exactly what we're looking for a community of comrades that like that's why there there is a a narrowness to that already right it's not just oh pick someone in the whole world right it's like no pick someone who has these same values right who shares certain aspects of what you're working toward and what your objectives are and you can start from that basis of trust to be what the comfort is right nicole reminded me of something really important that i encountered because uh i teach mostly online is that uh and and you know i definitely encountered this before in the past a lot more than nowadays but like people will will they really like to act like uh there's nothing you can learn via the computer or or through uh the internet and we need to remember that like there's nothing perfect or magical about classrooms right the same way that like so, you know, uh, yeah, like my experience with Duolingo is, is like I said, not so much from my own learning, but from my students. And, you know, first, just like as far as the bad things go, everything everyone said, I, I echo all of that. But on top of it, I really, really, really hate the podcast because it produces this weird back and forth where it says something in the other language and then goes back to English just to make you feel just comfortable enough. And so right when you're about to build that awkward like experience, it breaks it and gives you like a reprise and that it, it does that in exactly this way that's not pushing anybody to do anything. And so, um, but but at the same time, like I, I think that uh, what it's done is because it is inherently flawed, like we've talked about. And what I'm talking about in the piece is that it's flawed in the same way that just going somewhere is flawed, right? If you just decide you're going to go somewhere and that's how you're going to learn, you're also going to realize like that's a pretty like uh, naive uh, expectation, right? So in the sense that they're both flawed in the way that like, okay, uh, someone's going to that place, we'll work on your multilingualism when you get back, right? Like uh, that's that's great that you're going on that trip or like once you realize like, okay, you're going to need to work extra and not just simply like... Uh, uh, when you get there, it'll be magic and it'll happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, maybe we'll work online then, right? I think I need to just jump in just because like one of the things in your piece and you said something about like how tourists aren't, uh, I can't remember exactly what the phrasing is, um, but like there was a thing about how like tourists are not having an authentic experience of a place. And I was kind of sitting here like as someone who uh, often is forced to engage with expatriates and I hate that term so much um that's why I always call myself an immigrant <laughs> that is the community of which I identify with and who I hold solidarity with I do not give a shit about expatriates um <laughs> to put it nicely but those people also, like, they are immersed in the culture. And I think it's also even, you can take it farther than just tourists. Like, it's completely debatable whether or not these expats are even immersed at all, because they often um, refuse to interact with local schools. They refuse, like, to send their children to local schools. They send their children to international schools, which are usually in English. Um, they often are you know, embassy kids uh, who generally have an expectation that the world is built around them and which means that their family also usually works for like these big organizations, the UN, all the different embassies and whatnot. And so it's like, I think it's interesting that you focused on tourism or kind of using tourism as that thing. I'm sitting here like the whole time I was reading going, expats, expats are a prime example of people who can be and should be immersed and they refuse it. Like they actively refuse to engage with anything around them. 
Yeah, I think I think that that's uh, um, maybe maybe like in my thinking, I was just uh, kind of considering them longer term <laughs> tourists, you know, um, and and so um, yeah, tourists in a in a, a very general use of the word, visitors in a, in a foreign land. Um, but like like if if we can see that that the the apps are flawed and that you're not going to learn from that, but that. At the same time, this expectation that we've talked about that's been created by this capitalist system to like be catered to when you want to learn or that like like we've said also like that kind of meeting that demand that's obviously there, right? People want to do that. And this seems like the tool. And not only does it seem like the tool, it is the tool they know about, right? So my experience with them is that I encounter students who just already are using them. Right. And and that I don't actually get to come in as a very helpful, like, um, like participant in their learning if all I kind of can say is don't. Right. So what what I've tried and, and again, like kind of where my my own like um, uh, like. I don't know if you want to call it disenchantedness because it's not like I was ever allured by them to begin with. But like what I find difficult is that, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, what I've expected to be able to do is to tell students like, OK, go play with it. It's not going to be that useful for a longer term thing, but it might spark ideas. Right. So if you could come up with questions that you're forming from what you saw there, we could use that as a jumping off point, because like uh, pedagogically, that makes a lot of sense to me. But what I found, especially with my English students, my, my, my students who are Anglophones, is that they they don't have uh, uh, like a they, they don't have a, an experience of of what learning a language actually is. And so they don't know that until uh, they use Duolingo. It's actually like we said, like the most basic thing to just show them like, oh, this is bigger than I thought. And without using the app, they they um, just live in their fantasy of like, uh, uh, once I speak that language, life will be like this and I'll experience these things. Um, so also along along the idea of like maybe maybe something to do with these apps is the same thing to do with the uh, uh, traveling is to be the first mistake maybe someone actually kind of makes on the process of figuring out how to learn the language and that in that way, it's a very inconsequential first step. Uh, and yeah, it doesn't uh, in any way guarantee anything from anyone, but that um, it does cue that curiosity from someone, right? It's very, very common for people to talk to each other about their Duolingo experiences. And if we don't figure out as anarchists how to engage with that, and yeah, encourage something that becomes more anti-capitalist and more uh, organically and collectively like formed and organized, then I think we are missing an opportunity, especially as, you know, multilingual and internationally engaged uh, uh, anarchists, because I think that that um, there, there's something to how like you can't just go somewhere else. Like, like um, I also experienced, you know, not having the, the money to maybe travel somewhere else. But at the same time, like uh, I very proud and, and I, I like to be able to be uh, someone who can show people like that's not what what teaches you how to do those things. Right. It, it is the communication and that um, you don't need to wait for that. That, that this kind of waiting is is not uh, necessary. And I also think that the, the apps work in that way, where um, in the same way as everything else online, right, it, it promises a lot more than it's going to deliver. But if we could learn to like uh, uh, use that excitement to keep moving into something else so that there is an international movement of learning these languages. Like I said, when I was in that workshop, I was there for my own language practice, but I also encountered other people who were like, wow, I've experienced that same thing. And, and that was very surprising to me. I sort of, you know, uh, yeah, naively didn't really consider how, how much Duolingo was being used from other uh, angles. Which is, which is, yeah, bizarre anyway, because, you know, we've talked about the languages that are available. If you change your language you, for your app, 
it'll list different languages. So like you can learn Catalan from uh, Castellano, but you can't learn Catalan from English. And so uh, there's, there's all kinds of weird paths that go through the technology in that way. And so I think that we need to acknowledge how Duolingo and these other apps have put themselves in the way, but that it's also through us kind of figuring out the contours or maybe the ways to crack that apart the ways to steal pieces from it and expropriate them other places. It's through that, I think, that we could we could start to make them more useful to us. And that, yeah, in the meantime, like we don't need fancy apps to, you know, send emails to each other. Right. And and that um, it is very scary to communicate with someone in another language. But mm -hmm. that's actually the thing to get used to is is less the the perfectness, like some grammar structures are great, some words are great, but in practice, like you're going to make the mistakes. And actually there's an argument maybe to be made for how that's why we feel comfortable in our dominant languages is that we don't even notice our mistakes, right? So it, it feels like we're, we're doing a great job, but yeah, again, like maybe it's other people who've, who've learned that thing from another perspective who see the mistakes we're making, maybe not in our grammar or our, language per se, but in the way we're expressing our ideas or in the, the, yeah, kind of, uh, sentiments that those, the, the connotations that are attached to that. I think there's also a bit of like classism kind of related to this too, where even just within English by itself, um, cause I know I've already said it, but I'm from the rural Midwest <laughs> and people in the rural Midwest speak differently than how I actually sound because like you know like we have many different accents that kind of all culminate from people being from different places and whatnot but like a lot of how I sound kind of got beat into me in university because I was pronouncing things incorrectly um I had learned a lot of my English through reading <laughs> as many people do. So I didn't know how to say certain words, you know, like that. I think the constant mistake that everyone encounters is that it's supposed to be said epitome. And everyone's like, oh, no, this clearly says epitome. Uh, <laughs> and so you constantly have that kind of like in the back of your head, too, where it's like, it also kind of just depends on where you had to interact with these things. Um, and who is telling you? Because it's like, I constantly think about like what I'm saying in English or how I'm thinking or speaking in English, not so much thinking. I don't really police my own thoughts other than to tell myself to shut up. <laughs> but like, I'm constantly thinking about the mistakes as how other people will listen to me. But it could also just be, I think, something that's been kind of like not really in integrated into this, um, which could be a, yet again another topic is just neurodivergence. <laughs> because I know I'm constantly thinking about how I'm saying things in order to present things because I'm a, just I'm terrified of being uh, misunderstood. <laughs> and I think that kind of factors in too with like, can I communicate with this person? Can I even com contact this person? Because I know there are some people who feel just like absolutely uh, shy of contacting people, even in the same language that they already speak, <laughs> where it's like, this is something that I've literally had to teach myself. And I, re I think this is something that, again, another conversation probably is going to be needed for that one. Um, just because like, we do need to discuss like how it is okay to actually contact other people, because for some reason, we have developed this kind of weird culture, attitude, belief, somewhere that it's like we're going to inconvenience someone or we're going to get in their way or I don't know what <laughs> it depends on I guess what you have been taught um I think that the that it's from the multilingualism that we can learn to overcome that right that maybe that is the the domain where we can start to to innovate those practices because there's a different motivation for it that's not just like oh I have this problem I need to get over it Instead, it's like, I, I know that the only way to learn is through the communication. And so the communication is itself the practice. It's not uh, 
just for the sake of it, or it, it, it maybe is a way of getting out of some of the fears that it's just a personal like thing you're trying to communicate and no one else cares that like, again, if we can, we can assume we're, we're trying to communicate with uh, comrades and people we're sharing uh, ideas with, then, then the reception of that is also, I, I think, yeah, like it's, it's taken in good faith. Right. And that that's, that's part of what we need is not just a network of people to send messages in another language to, but, but recipients that we know are already, um, assuming we're coming from a place of solidarity and attempting to build greater solidarity. It was such a delight to speak with Carl again to delve into this conversation, and we're already looking forward to the next time should there be one. This discussion of language learning is quite complex, but there have been numerous patterns that we've all recognized around us. The excessive focus on learning English has had complex impacts, some of which can be viewed as positive, but can largely be viewed as detrimental to all people, including first language English speakers. The ease of access to tools that help us learn languages has made things more possible, but those tools are rarely available in already marginalized languages and can leave a lot to be desired with their focus purely on vocabulary rather than actually using the language. Since there is so much to discuss, please feel free to reach out or create your own responses. If there are additional topics that you want to discuss, let us know. We often look forward to hearing from anyone, so drop us a line. And if you want to hear more from us at the APC, go to our website at anarchistpedagogies.net, where you can find more information and all of the links to our social media. Everything discussed in this episode will be linked in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.